Around the world, more and more people are becoming infected with COVID-19. The new Omicron variant is extremely contagious. Vaccinated people are also contracting it, though their cases are usually much milder. What treatments are available? Which medications can help? We talk to medical professionals in Germany. And we head to Uganda, where traditional remedies are also being used to fight the coronavirus. Plus, is vaccination the way out of the pandemic, or could new antiviral drugs be the long-awaited game changers? But first, we head to Poland. With one of Europe's lowest vaccination rates at just 55%, the Omicron wave is especially worrying. Krakow, Poland's second largest city after Warsaw, is a lively university city. Here too, doctors are concerned about rising infection rates and are preparing for many people to fall seriously ill. On ventilators fighting for their lives, none of the 20 people on this COVID-19 ward at Krakow University Hospital are vaccinated. Gregorz, who's just been admitted to the ward, says he was scared the vaccine would affect another medical condition he has. Until now, I didn't know how the vaccine would affect me. But anyway, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. The question is now from my doctor, how long after leaving the hospital can I be vaccinated? Right now, the caseload here is manageable, but they're bracing as infection numbers in Poland surge. Am I frustrated that people are not getting vaccinated? Uh, frustration is a difficult term to, to define. I just wish people trusted uh, medical experts more. Weak and weary, the staff try to get the patients moving again. Up to half of the patients on this ward will end up needing intensive care support. It's so frequent that the staff here at Krakow University Hospital have set up special pathways that go underground straight from this ward to the ICU. Doctors here say currently around a fifth of the people admitted with COVID don't make it out of the hospital. When I remember first wave, we had mostly very elder people and a lot of them in fact died. Uh, today, age of patients is different. We have patients who are 40, 50 years old. There's an ongoing discussion in Poland about whether the reluctance to be vaccinated comes from a long-standing lack of confidence in public institutions, a hangover from the communist era, or whether the government's information campaign around the jabs was insufficient. Only 56.5% of Poles are vaccinated with two doses, and it wasn't hard to find people on the streets of Krakow who hadn't had it. Whatever. Vaccinated people also get the virus, and they're spreading the virus too, and carrying and suffering. At the place where I was working, everyone who was vaccinated got severely ill. Me, I wasn't vaccinated, and I never got sick. I don't know what to say about vaccines because I'm not vaccinated. They are something new in the world, and I don't know what the side effects might be. The steel production company, ArcelorMittal Poland, is offering its 10,000 employees a bonus of just over 400 euros if they prove they're fully vaccinated. They say it's getting results. The response has, has been overwhelming because the program was only introduced on the 21st of December last year. And in the first three weeks, we received as many as four and a half thousand applications. So it means that four and a half thousand of our employees have been vaccinated. While private initiatives like that might have a local effect, increasing vaccination rates needs a nationwide effort. Poland has passed the unwelcome milestone of 100,000 COVID deaths. And with the low vaccine take-up and with the fifth wave looming, hospitals like this one warn the number of deaths will spike again. The pandemic has fostered a growing public interest in science and research. Our reporters have been interviewing specialists to gain insight from their expertise on the coronavirus. This time, Christina Kufner is talking to Marilyn Addo, 
head of infectious diseases at the University Medical Center Hamburg Eppendorf. We want to know which methods have proven effective in treating COVID-19 and when they're used. Professor Addo, great to speak with you. On our show, we look into treating COVID-19 cases. You're a researcher of infectious disease, but also treat patients. So first of all, a general question. How do you treat COVID patients admitted to the hospital? Various factors play a role here. There's a wide spectrum of patients who've gotten SARS-CoV-2, and of course the treatment depends on the severity of the illness. There are those who come to the emergency room with a runny nose after having contact with someone who has the coronavirus but otherwise have no symptoms. They're sent back home to recover from what's otherwise just a cold. A lot depends on the patient. If someone has risk factors for severe illness and needs to be hospitalized, then they would be admitted as an inpatient. The treatment options range from supportive therapy, such as reducing fever and increasing fluid intake, depending on how the patient feels. But if, for example, oxygen is required, then other measures may be necessary. The key treatments are antiviral medications to fight the virus itself and anti-inflammatory drugs, which are sometimes helpful in the later stages of the disease if there's an inflammatory reaction. So the treatment depends on the patient, the severity of the illness and where they are in the course of the disease. Are they in the early phase or has it progressed? There are many possibilities. How have modes of treatment developed over the course of the pandemic? What's been learned from the outcomes? It's been an interesting process, learning by doing. Two years ago, at the start of the pandemic, we didn't have any medications available because none had been specifically developed for it. We trialed drugs with an antiviral effect used to treat other diseases, also an antiparasitic. We're talking about hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin or remdesivir. Then studies were conducted and showed that some of these drugs were of no or only marginal benefit. But now drugs have been developed, monoclonal antibodies, which fight the virus and can be given early on. Large studies have been carried out and shown that dexamethasone has a very good anti-inflammatory effect. So we already have a more extensive range of treatment options compared to what was available at the beginning of the pandemic. Do treatments differ based on whether someone's vaccinated or not? There's no single answer. It all depends on the individual patient and the severity of the illness. With high-risk patients, other therapy options would be discussed. The only point of differentiation is the administering of monoclonal antibodies. If someone is fully vaccinated with good antibody levels, antibody treatment wouldn't be considered. But for those with risk factors for severe illness, like cancer patients who haven't developed any immunity, then when administered early, monoclonal antibodies are a very good option. We also know that the effectiveness of the vaccines differs depending on the virus variant. Is the particular variant also a factor as to which medications and treatments are used? Yes, antiviral drugs and monoclonal antibodies don't work for all variants. For example, there are antibodies that work well against Delta but not against Omicron and vice versa. So it's certainly a factor. According to a study from the university hospital where you work, there are indications that even a moderate case of COVID leaves traces on organs. Could you elaborate? It's a very interesting study led by our cardiology center of over 400 people who were mildly or moderately ill. 
the Studienleiter haben eine Studie gemacht. In a seven-hour examination, the study team looked closely at effects that may not be clinically apparent, but are still detectable. Untersuchung, was für Auswirkungen das haben kann, die vielleicht klinisch nicht apparent sind, aber They looked at the kidneys, heart, lungs and veins in the legs. About nine months after a coronavirus infection, they observed and measured slight reductions in the organs functioning. This needs to serve as a warning against the attitude, oh, let's just catch it. It needs to be taken seriously, and patients should continue to be monitored after they've recovered. Und auch gegebenenfalls äh, in der Nachsorge noch mal sich äh, durch noch mal, noch mal testen lassen. But we must be sagen, careful to point out that these findings should not alarm people. At nine months, the differences could still be detected. But if this will still be the case in the long term, must be investigated further. Overall, we're still in the early days of this whole pandemic. But this is undoubtedly an important indication that the heart, lungs and kidneys can be affected. The good news is, we didn't observe any neurocognitive problems in the study groups. Oh, Professor, Professor Addo, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. My pleasure. Greetings from Hamburg. In Uganda, only 13% of the population is fully vaccinated, and there's a supply shortage. To contain the spread of the coronavirus, the government enforced one of the strictest lockdowns in the world. The public health care system is still overwhelmed. This has caused many people to turn to traditional medicinal plants and healing methods. It's medicine time for Ugandan engineer Hennington Subuga. Doctors suspect that he's suffering side effects of the COVID-19 treatment he received in the hospital. I was on oxygen for like uh, two weeks and uh, later I started getting off the oxygen, very terrible experience. They put on me like seven IVs on, on arrival. This one was getting out, they're adding another one, they're adding another one. Sabuga is now using herbs to treat persistent abdominal discomfort. He says they also help to boost his immune system in general. Currently, I'm using a herbalist from uh, the UAE. They sent me some medicine, herbal medicine in, in form of capsules, but it's doing a great job. More than six out of 10 Ugandans use herbal remedies before seeking conventional medicine. And when COVID-19 broke out, many took the herbal option. Dizzy Nabawizi has been steaming with local herbs usually used to treat the common cold. She thinks it could also help against COVID. Whenever I had a cold or cough, I would steam and it totally relieved my nasal congestion. My entire body would feel revitalized. When Emmanuel Twesigia tested positive for COVID-19, a doctor prescribed him medicine. He finished the course, but still felt unwell. A friend recommended a Ugandan herbal remedy called Covidex. The first years data, it was trying to adventure, was recommended by a colleague who had also used it and knowing that he got well. I had undertaken all the other the said treatments of COVID, but the source lot had become a problem. and. I had to use the drops as it was prescribed and it worked perfectly because after my prescribed dosage, I was utterly fine, so. Covidex is made by Ugandan scientist, Dr. Patrick Ogwang. The researcher claims that his herbal solution has cured more than 300 people, but the drug regulator has cautioned the university professor against claims of curing COVID-19. We have approved the, uh, the herbal remedies for symptomatic relief of certain um, uh, symptoms, not its symptomatic uh, relief. We haven't approved them for uh, therapeutic treatment and curative. Covidex is sold in drugstores as a remedy for cold or flu symptoms, including those of COVID-19. Uganda is now funding its development. 
would want to have uh, a documented uh, uh, study, or that would be a clinical trial, to show that uh, this uh, remedy actually, apart from providing the, uh, the supportive relief, actually has the therapeutic uh, claims. And what effects uh, happen? From the clinical trials, you have uh, patients uh, carrying out the trials in uh, a, controlled, a controlled environment. I will need to know that if you are carrying out uh, trials in a particular uh, remedy in, within a controlled uh, condition, I know what the person is taking, I know what uh, I expect to, to, be, uh, to be observed. Seven out of ten Ugandans self-medicate. The National Drug Authority, the country's regulator of healthcare products, says that the pandemic has made it worse. It says there have been accidents resulting from improper self-medication. We've had issues here uh, where people, of course, use uh, cannabis. We've had people die, uh, suffocate, while steaming uh, in uncontrolled uh, manner. Uh, so it, 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 can, it can go uh, the other way. Some of the world's most common conventional medicines derive from traditional remedies. Scientific investigation could prove whether or not there's real healing power in the Ugandan herbal remedies. And perhaps the world could benefit from this traditional knowledge during the coronavirus pandemic. Since the beginning of the pandemic, our DW Science correspondent, Derek Williams, has been keeping up with the latest research from the fields of science and medicine in a search for answers. If you have a question for him, do write to us. This week, Ben R. asks, if I get COVID-19, which treatments are available? Pharmaceutical treatments for COVID-19 can be roughly broken down into two categories. Um, the first is therapies for people with severe disease. Now, early in the pandemic, medical authorities desperately searched for ways to keep late stage patients with serious illness from dying. Um, once SARS-CoV-2 settles into the lungs, it can cause the body's immune response to, to, to spiral out of control and, and start doing more harm than good. When that happens, the experts say, people are basically killed by their own hyperactive immune system. So hospitalized patients with severe disease are given anti-inflammatories to help calm that immune response down. Uh, the most widely used of these is a, a steroid called dexamethasone. Um, COVID patients with severe cases also often receive non-pharmaceutical treatments that include, for instance, supplemental oxygen. The second category of treatments includes drugs that are meant to be given at earlier stages of the disease to help keep it from getting any worse. Um, those treatments include what are known as uh, monoclonal antibodies, often called MABs. Now, the body learns to make its own protective antibodies during an infection, and it's their job to identify a virus very selectively based on specific viral surface proteins, then home in and dock on, which neutralizes the virus or, or flags it up for destruction by other cells in the immune system. The problem is learning to recognize a pathogen takes time for the body. And for some patients, the lesson is just learned too late. Um, MABs, are artificial antibodies made in bioreactors, so outside of the body, but they can help it fight off an infection at an earlier stage of the disease. Um, several different types have been approved for emergency use in a number of countries, but 
But maps are expensive to manufacture, and they can be fooled by variants. Um, two monoclonal antibodies used against earlier variants of SARS-CoV-2, for instance, appear to not really work against Omicron. Then there are antivirals, which to have a real effect also have to be given soon after symptoms appear. Now, antivirals interfere with viral replication, which lowers viral load. Uh, that basically gives your immune system time to catch up. Um, the best known COVID antiviral is called remdesivir, uh, which has been used to treat patients really since the early days of the pandemic. Um, but its effectiveness is also hotly debated, and, and it has a big drawback, which is that it has to be administered intravenously, so in a medical setting. Uh, in the last few months, though, a couple of antivirals that can be taken in, in pill form, so at home, they've proven quite promising. Experts now hope that the new medications, um, Paxlovid and Molnupiravir, uh, that they'll be powerful new weapons in the fight against COVID-19. Across the world, hospital workers have been pushed to the edge with the latest Omicron wave. Infections in Germany are expected to peak in mid-February. However, if two new antiviral drugs deliver what they promise, it will alleviate a lot of pressure. DW's Pippa Stevens visited a German hospital to find out why they're so important. This is Dr. David Jung. He's a respiratory specialist who's been particularly in demand during the coronavirus pandemic. For nearly two years, he's been looking after patients in the COVID ward at Bethel Hospital in Berlin. The situation in the last couple of weeks has been challenging as the numbers of infected people have been rising so much, especially in Berlin. Um, and staff morale is also a problem because we've been going through wave after wave and always been hoping that the last wave would have been the last, which it never was. Um, but at the moment, we're coping. Healthcare systems under pressure are a familiar tale in the pandemic, but doctors in Germany are about to gain access to two drugs that could help significantly lighten the burden. One of them, an antiviral called Paxlovid, was found in clinical trials to reduce hospitalizations and deaths by 89%. That's compared to a placebo. The other, called Molnupiravir, reduced hospitalizations and deaths by 30% in trials. That's also compared to a placebo. If the effects of the new drugs um, are as pronounced as has been reported, um, that could help us tremendously um, to reduce the load on the hospitals uh, in the whole country and yeah, potentially the whole world. And that's because the drugs reduce the viral load in the patient's body and with it, the number of serious cases. Typically, the virus spreads rapidly in human cells, as seen here. The new medicines inhibit an enzyme in the virus and halt replication. Paxlovid was developed by farmer giant Pfizer, which is also behind one of the main COVID vaccines. Both drugs can be taken in pill form. They're aimed at patients with a high risk of hospitalization and should be given within five days of experiencing initial symptoms. In Germany, prescriptions will be issued right after a patient receives a positive test result. Doctors in the U.S., the U.K., and now also in the E.U. have been given the all-clear to prescribe Paxlovid. Germany's doctors are about to receive their first shipments. These kinds of drugs could help to get the problems wrought by the pandemic under control. With all these patients who probably are vaccinated, the number of patients who succumb is low anyway. However, the critical infrastructure hospital has a problem if too many patients come with severe disease. And therefore, it's the right drug to the right point of time. The fact that the new antivirals come in pill form makes them an attractive alternative to the antiviral currently on offer in Germany, remdesivir. Remdesivir actually in um, uh, Omicron has good efficacy, but it's an IV drug 
and needs to be given over a couple of days. So let, finally, if we, if we would talk remdesivir, we would bring in patients for an IV drug treatment to avoid hospitalization. That is logistic nonsense. So drugs that keep patients out of the hospital, that don't have to be administered in the hospital, could prove to be pretty revolutionary. Preventing breakdowns in overloaded healthcare systems is perhaps the most important goal of politicians across the world. Some say it's perhaps the most critical milestone on the path to COVID becoming an endemic rather than a pandemic disease.